Let's go. All right, welcome everybody uh, to my talk on uh, lessons learned from running Prometheus. Um, sadly, um, uh, Lily was supposed to join us today, but she couldn't make it sadly, um, but um, we'll go ahead anyway. Um, I'm Frederick. Um, I'm a, one of the maintainers for the Prometheus project um, for almost four years now. Um, and even beyond that, I've been a long time user of Prometheus. Um, yeah. So um, before we uh, kind of dive deep into all the operational things of Prometheus, um, there may be some folks that aren't familiar with Prometheus, and this talk is totally suited for those folks as well who are just kind of trying to understand um, Prometheus as a technology and trying to under, uh, decide whether, whether to buy into it um, and whether to use it a lot. Um, and hopefully with this talk, um, I can kind of uh, make everyone who is already using Prometheus more comfortable with using it, and those who aren't already using Prometheus kind of um, convince them that Prometheus is the right choice. Um, so on a very high level, um, Prometheus is an open source monitoring system. Um, and one of the first things that people always talk about uh, with Prometheus is the pull-based model. Um, a lot of monitoring systems are push-based so that your application kind of pushes the metrics um, to some central system. Prometheus kind of turns this around and um, gathers metrics on a periodic basis from your application. And we'll keep coming back to this pull-based mechanism um, during this talk, and we'll see why truly pull-based, a pull-based monitoring system makes, um, makes a really great fit um, for operational purposes. Um, and just another interesting side fact, um, Prometheus was originally created at SoundCloud um, by folks who had previously worked at Google and kind of knew a lot of the systems uh, inside of Google. Um, and that's why Prometheus is very heavily inspired by um, a lot of the things that they had experience with at Google. Um, so on a super simple level, uh, let's do a very quick example of how Prometheus might work in a real system. So we have our Prometheus server, and as I said, um, it's a pull-based system, right? So we have our target, let's say an HTTP um, application that serves some API, and Prometheus comes every scrape interval, is what we call this, um, and collects metrics from our target um, over time. And it does that until eternity. And every time it scrapes this from our target, it takes the metrics and inserts it into its internal time series database. And that's really the, um, the nut, Prometheus in a nutshell, right? Um, obviously, um, there's a lot more to it, and we'll talk a lot about that in this talk as well. But to kind of um, level the playing field and make sure that everybody's on the same page of uh, Prometheus, let's dive into a couple more uh, basics. So the way that um, the scraping works is, um, as I said already, Prometheus goes and scrapes every 15 seconds, for example. Um, but it does a little bit more. Because Prometheus knows which targets to, to scrape, um, it can automatically add some metadata about these targets, right? In this case, I have a, I have a web server which has metrics about the HTTP request it has served. Um, and these are counters, right? So these are ever-growing monotonically increasing counters, and Prometheus just every time it collects the metrics gets a snapshot of those, right? And so over time, this counter grows, and Prometheus sees that growing over time as well. Um, and so once Prometheus has scraped this, and that's kind of the representation that is presented to Prometheus on our left side here, um, Prometheus adds this metadata. In this case, I chose to just add the instance label, um, but there you can add other um, kind of arbitrary metadata represented as labels. Um, Prometheus adds this, um, and in this form then inserts it into its internal time series database. Um, and why this is really powerful is because this is essentially what people talk about when they say um, Prometheus has a multidimensional um, data model, 
because with this data model, um, PromQL was created. PromQL is the query language that was specifically designed uh, to work with time series um, and ultimately for alerting purposes. So that because a monitoring system is ultimately there to make sure that our systems are reliable and that they actually behave in the way that we expect, right? Um, so I have another example on my left here. And um, you can note that um, these sets of time series that I have here are um, coming from different targets. So let's, this could be an example of I have two processes that uh, Prometheus is scraping every interval um, and collects these metrics. And we can see the instance label changes here, right? Um, and why this becomes powerful with the multidimensional model and with PromQL, we'll see with a couple of examples now. So let's say this is my PromQL query, just HTTP request total code 200. And what this does is it returns me the time series that matches this exact um, kind of slice of the data, right? We can now, in a very powerful way, slice and dice our data and get exactly the um, answer to the questions that we're asking. So in this case, uh, we get all the results from all the instances because we ask for all the time series that match the HTTP request total metric name and the code to XX, right? Um, but we can take this a lot further. Uh, we can even sum these, right? Um, and now the result um, kind of, because because of how sum is an aggregation, there's actually no resulting um, label set, um, but we get um, a resulting uh, scalar. So it's just a number, right? Um, which in this case is 72, because that's the sum of the previous um, kind of samples that we had seen. But we can do even more powerful things. And I won't dive into all the things that you can do with PromQL, but I'm just kind of trying to show you how this multidimensional model works. Um, but one more example that I think is kind of cool um, is you can even say you want to sum by some specific label and group those essentially. And in this case, we would then get in our result set this um, uh, by label. Um, so we have the 2xx, 3xx, 4xx, 5xx. It essentially looks for all the labels that label values that exist for this and then sum their, um, their values, right? And this way we can actually get a global view of our entire infrastructure and how it's doing, right? Because ultimately monitoring is about um, understanding the way that your users experience your system. And that's really most powerful when we have a holistic view over our entire infrastructure and not just individual um, individual processes, right? We really care about how our, our users holistically experiencing this. And kind of ending our short uh, Prometheus intro, um, alerting also is super simple in Prometheus. Um, we kind of have the basics of how data is gathered and inserted into its time series database, as well as how querying works. And now uh, alerting kind of becomes trivial because the way that alerting works is not how a lot of uh, traditional monitoring systems had worked, which were kind of, you wrote a check, and if a check fails, you alert, for example. Prometheus works on evaluating queries against uh, the data that it has in its time series database. And again, there's no magic in Prometheus. These rules are just evaluated at some interval, which also um, defaults to 15 seconds, just like the scrape interval. Um, so these are kind of, this is a very uh, basic uh, introduction to Prometheus. There's obviously a lot to it, a lot more to it. But um, with this, we can kind of now build uh, the operational experience and understand um, why Prometheus is so awesome. Um, and I want to show you a very quick example um, of the Prometheus IO website. When you visit this website, this is one of the things that you see on the front page. Um, and in particular in this talk, and from now on um, in this talk, we want to um, focus on this part, simple operation. Um, and we're going di to dive deep into um, why Prometheus 
um, is so popular um, with its simple operational aspects. So in some way, we could have also mentioned, uh, called this talk, what makes Prometheus simple to operate, right? Um, instead of lessons learned from Prometheus. Um, and one of the things, and this, this is literally something that the Prometheus IO website said in that tile, but, um, and it's really a, a very simple thing. Um, some people just don't even think about it, but um, I've come to appreciate this a lot. And a lot of people kind of get hooked on Prometheus because it's so, so easy to get started with. Prometheus is a single statically linked binary. So all you do when you start trying out Prometheus is you download that binary for your architecture and your operating system. Um, and Prometheus compiles for pretty much everything that um, Golang um, compiles to, which is almost everything that exists out there. Um, and this makes it absolutely trivial to get started and you get super quick wins and kind of you start to experience Prometheus um, in a super quick way. Um, and I think that's really powerful and uh, one of the primary reasons why people get kind of hooked on Prometheus because um, it has all the, all the functionality in this one uh, binary and you get it super, super quickly started. Another thing that um, I think is uh, often overlooked and I've only kind of started appreciating this over time is um, it has very, very strict rules about how it's configured, but um, that also makes it incredibly consistent. And when you want to configure something, you kind of, because of these consistent rules, you always know where to look essentially. Um, anything that you can reconfigure at runtime is in a configuration pile. Um, and you can reload these con con configuration files either by sending a signal to, to the process or calling an HTTP endpoint. And it'll automatically reload everything. And that can be alerting rules. That can be um, all kinds of configuration. Um, and configuration that will last for the entire lifetime of the process is configured via flag. So there's really, those are the only two things that you need to think about when you configure Prometheus. There are no environment variables, um, nothing like that. Um, everything is either in a file or in a, um, in a flag. Um, and as, as kind of a side effect of that, um, there, there's a really awesome and concise reference, reference documentation on the Prometheus website. Um, because it's so consistent, um, that's a very easy thing for us maintainers um, to keep up to date and kind of keep precise and concise. Um, so now we kind of have, those were kind of the simple things about operational aspects of Prometheus. Um, a lot of other systems could, um, could replicate this. Um, but ultimately, and this is where we keep coming back to the pull model, um, this is why uh, I think Prometheus is so popular, um, resource usage. And to understand why I think that's the case, um, we need to understand resource usage of Prometheus. Now, um, this is literally uh, the Prometheus that uh, I, um, I, among others, operate um, at Red Hat. And um, as you can see, um, we have, this is a relatively big instance, right? We have uh, thousands upon thousands of uh, time series in this Prometheus running. And uh, we can see um, CPU usage is actually quite low. There's it's something between 0.1 and 0.2 um, CPU cores, um, but we have something between five to six gigs of memory. Um, and one interesting thing to note here is kind of the um, sawtooth pattern, right? Um, and we want to understand why that is. Um, and this is one of the first things that people, when people run Prometheus, they kind of see this and think, oh, memory usage is kind of continuously growing. Um, maybe there's a memory leak, right? But this is totally intentional and let's, I want to explain why this is the case um, and why it's actually a good thing. Um, and to understand it, we need to dive a little bit into the time series database that we had introduced in Prometheus 2.0 um, back in 2017 already actually, in three years almost already, time flies. Um, the way that this time series database works, again, this is compiled into Prometheus, um, part of that single statically linked binary. Um, is kind of 
very much modeled like a lot of other modern databases are modeled. There's a write ahead log um, where essentially um, there's a there's a write ahead log next to the um, conceptually next to the head block. The head block um, essentially receives all the inserts into the time series database, right? We accumulate those for two hours um, and we always append all these writes to a write ahead log so that if Prometheus or the note, entire node that it's on crashes, um, we can kind of recover from this and uh, pick up just where we left off. Um, but the interesting thing that I mentioned here is this two hour block. So we accumulate two hours worth of data and then we flush it to disk. And this is really important because once we flush this from disk, it's no longer fully in memory. It's actually memory mapped. MAP is like a, um, a kernel a system call. Um, and a lot of you are probably much more familiar with the intricacies of MMAP than I am. But uh, for those who are not familiar with it, um, essentially MMAP is a way to tell the kernel, um, make it look like all of this data that is on disk is in memory for me. And you, the kernel, take care of kind of um, transparently loading this data from disk into memory and evicting it as necessary, right? And why this is super powerful is now we can essentially assume all this data is in memory, um, which obviously our disk tends to be much larger than the amount of memory that we have available. Um, but it seems like it's in memory, right? And so the kernel uh, can kind of optimally make use of all the memory available. And what that ultimately means is that for queries, for example, um, if there's a lot of memory available, we'll, we tend to reply to queries super quickly because it's already in memory. But even if there's not a lot of memory available, it'll just take time because the kernel loads and evicts memory all the time, but it'll still eventually reply. And that's really, really powerful. Um, and most useful about this is that we can roughly assume that this entire um, part of the database, everything that we've flushed to disk, is roughly of constant um, memory usage for us. Um, and that makes essentially the write ahead log and the head block um, the interesting thing about memory usage because the MMAP part stays roughly the same the entire time and we can, um, we can largely ignore it. Um, so memory usage actually comes from this two hour pattern. Um, and now we already kind of see where the sawtooth pattern uh, came from that we looked at in the graph earlier. It's precisely because of um, adding these samples and time series uh, to the head block, which is in memory. And once we've hit this two hour time, uh, time slot, uh, we flush it to disk and start over. And that's exactly where this memory drop occurs. But um, we want to understand even better what within this head block actually causes the memory usage, right? Because, because we have this multidimensional model, essentially um, there are two things that uh, largely make up any block. And this is the ca same uh, case for head blocks as well as on disk block. But again, on disk we can largely ignore for resource usage because it's practically limit. Uh, constant. But within a block, um, we can see here, we, we, we have roughly an average of 1000 bytes per series. So any um, unique, unique um, combination of labels, right? Um, we can see here four um, theoretical time series. And into each of these time series, we insert samples, right? And we can see a series um, in our index, because ultimately this is a search engine roughly, right? Um, it's an inverted index. Um, a series is wildly more expensive than a sample. Um, obviously we add a lot more samples uh, than we add series, but um, the, the whole point of this is a series is much, much more expensive than samples. Um, and the way that we, um, I kind of uh, skipped over here. Um, I said samples are really, really cheap, right? 1.3 bytes on average. 
the way that this is achieved is with um, a very specific um, compression algorithm that's specifically meant for metrics and time series. Um, it kind of originated from a, a Facebook um, research paper called Gorilla. Um, it's very popular among other uh, monitoring systems as well. Um, and there's a really fantastic talk here uh, that I recommend everybody watching if you're very interested in the kind of nitty gritty details of this compression algorithm, um, which I don't have the time for in this talk, uh, but if you're interested, I highly recommend it. Um, this talk is called uh, 16 bytes at scale because essentially a timestamp is eight bytes and a sample is eight bytes uncompressed. Um, so 16 bytes per sample um, and doing this at scale and how we can kind of compress this down to on average 1.3 bytes. So um, the whole point was though to understand how memory usage works, right? And um, all of what I've talked about so far is just understanding memory usage conceptually. If you really want to understand um, and kind of almost have a formula of how to calculate your memory usage, I recommend checking out this blog post by Brian Brazel from Robust Perception, um, where essentially he builds something where you can just insert um, things into a formula and it'll spit out your kind of worst case um, memory usage. Um, I, I don't want to dive into uh, that formula in particular. Um, I just want to give everybody a conceptual understanding of, um, of memory usage in Prometheus. And everything that we've talked about so far, um, what I wanted to get across essentially is um, that the index is so much more um, expensive, right? But um, as I said earlier already, even though um, a series is very expensive, um, we tend to insert thousands of samples into a series. However, the compression algorithm that I mentioned uh, kind of groups samples into so-called chunks. And for the compression algorithm, again, if you, the, for the nitty-gritty details, I recommend watching the talk, but for um, this compression algorithm, on average, to be optimal, we need 120 samples per chunk. Um, and ultimately, this is a mean to kind of a trade-off of grouping uh, samples, but also making them quickly addressable in the index, right? Um, but at 120 samples per chunk, um, with a two-hour interval, because remember, our blocks are two hours in size, at a 15 second scrape interval, that makes 480 samples or grouped into chunks, that makes four chunks. And chunks in themselves are complete, right? So we can reuse an, a technique that we've already seen the, in this talk, which is um, anything that is complete, we can memory map to disk. And we can see here essentially um, these samples that we had previously individually can now be memory map, mapped to disk. Um, and only the kind of active chunks that haven't been completed, that haven't reached 120 samples per chunk, um, are still in memory, which um, ultimately reduced, um, it depends on kind of the way that your Prometheus um, actually um, ingests data or what data it ingests, but there was a huge, um, kind of when, when this was introduced, actually just a couple weeks ago, uh, this was released in Prometheus 2.19. And I wanna give a huge shout out to Ganesh who did all of this work. Um, and um, yeah, he wrote a, a fantastic blog post about um, the nitty gritty details of how this in particular works. Um, and the win of this was cutting another 10 to 40% um, of memory usage um, from Prometheus. Um, so um, all of this is even more reduced, right? But what I want you to take away uh, from this section of the talk is conceptually for Prometheus, the head block is much more um, uh, significant for the resource usage of Prometheus than um, all the blocks that have already been flushed to disk and series take up 
significantly more resources than samples. And so ultimately what that means is more series means more resource usage, right? Because samples are relatively cheap, whereas series are comparatively expensive. So that's really, really important. And that's where the majority of resource usage comes from. So that's why essentially when we talk about load of Prometheus, we talk about the number of series that a head block has to manage. And this entire kind of philosophy results in something that people often refer to with, when working with Prometheus as set and forget. It kind of means that since um, Prometheus continuously scrapes all this data and targets tend to be um, relatively stable um, in the series that they expose, um, resource usage, while initially re seems relatively high, it actually stays exactly the same over time. And so it can be kind of daunting when you do this, for the, when you set up Prometheus for the first time, and it feels like memory usage is relatively high. Um, remember that this is kind of the maximum load that Prometheus will ever get, right? Um, so I encourage you to kind of stick with it um, and uh, understand that this is what makes Prometheus so powerful actually, right? Um, so as I already said, um, we keep coming back to this pull model. Because of this pull model, that's exactly why we have this characteristic. Um, and because targets tend to be relatively stable in the um, number of series that they expose. Um, and ultimately that re leads to very uh, predictable usage um, of resources. Now, um, and this kind of plays um, also into the set and forget uh, mindset. Um, it's less about memory usage though than um, disk usage actually. And this is probably a um, concept that many are familiar with from other monitoring systems, which is retention as in the time, how long I keep my data for, right? By default, this is 15 days in Prometheus. In theory, it, there's no limit to it, um, but there are practical limits to it, obviously, like disk size, um, how much you want to use. And here, again, we kind of um, fall into the uh, set and forget model because once you've reached your attention for, um, for the first time um, and you've started kind of hitting that 15 days period, let's say, this is the maximum um, disk size that you'll need for your Prometheus, effectively. Um, now, obviously, it can be slightly more nuanced, but typically that's exactly how it is. Um, and again, this makes it incredibly predictable, and you can kind of, um, again, do this, this set and forget kind of characteristic. You can set it up, and that's a really important characteristic of a monitoring system because you don't want to have to think about it when you don't need it but it must be there, it must be functional when things are on fire and you really, really need your monitoring system. And so the way that the retention works is simply because everything is managed in block, we can just delete this entire block. So this is really nice from a capacity planning perspective, but even, um, uh, it's maybe a little bit of a detail, but it's even um, a really simple operation for Prometheus to do. It's just deleting a couple of files on this and that's it. Now, um, I've mentioned a couple of times um, that the full model um, is so powerful because it makes things kind of stable, right? But um, how does Prometheus actually know what to scrape? And there are, there's a mechanism that is called target discovery or service discovery um, in Prometheus. And there are a couple of um, kind of built-in integrations, but you can also just um, specify a static list, but there are popular integrations like Kubernetes is a really popular uh, system these days, um, but also other things like console or just plain DNS discovery can be used. And you can use all of these things to kind of automatically discover your targets as your infrastructure changes, right? And the interesting thing about this is Prometheus scales exactly with your infrastructure uh, as your infrastructure scales, right? Um, so it's very predictable in that way again. So I want to give you a very quick example of the way that this would look like with um, 
with Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, we have a concept um, that we call pod. Um, and these are essentially units of processing. Um, this can be, uh, there, there, there can be multiple containers in a pod and a container typically runs one process, right? So we can vaguely refer to it as a group of processes. Um, and in Kubernetes, typically you group your services, at your, your pods with services. Um, and this is, in Kubernetes, this is not just a logical grouping. This is also used for network um, routing, essentially, but that's not super interesting for Prometheus um, because Prometheus wants to go to each individual process and scrape them, right? However, this is still really powerful to Prometheus because Prometheus can just discover the service and um, through the service discover, okay, these are the pods behind the service and discover them that way. And when you create a third pod, a fourth pod, Prometheus automatically discovers this and starts scraping them. Um, and this is not just powerful um, to kind of dynamically keep up with this infrastructure, but Prometheus can also add additional metadata because of this. We have this logical grouping of a Kubernetes service now as well. And so all of these can be labels that can be attached to your targets, as I showed in the very beginning um, with the instance label, but also with um, kind of arbitrary metadata that you know about your infrastructure. Um, and that makes not just querying really powerful, but again, Prometheus will just scale exactly the way that your infrastructure scales. Um, so we come, keep coming back to this predictability aspect of Prometheus. Um, and uh, once, let me just say, say this, Prometheus scales incredibly far um, without having to do any sort of um, distributed um, sharding, um, but there's always a limit. Um, it may be that you can have larger instance sizes um, um, on your cloud provider, for example, or um, your machines quite just aren't, uh, aren't can't, you can't just magically increase the machine size of your bare metal hardware. Um, there can be all sorts of uh, circumstances, but Prometheus scales incredibly to an incredible scale, um, vert, vert, just vertically. Um, but ultimately, you, there's always an end to um, vertical scaling, and when that happens, you can make use of hash mark charting. And this is also, again, there's nothing magic in Prometheus, uh, quite a simple um, mechanism. We literally just take a hash of some label um, that can be any met metadata that you obtain through service discovery, and we um, kind of perform just mod on it, right? So um, a theoretical example with our pods discovered in Kubernetes could be um, for shard zero of our Prometheus, uh, we take mod one of our targets, right? And so we would get uh, uh, pod zero and pod two. And for shard one, we um, would get the exact inversion. And this works um, kind of uh, to any scale that you need, right? Um, so once you go to get, get to that scale, even that is possible with Prometheus. And why I mentioned this is kind of Prometheus um, is so incredibly powerful um, because it's really simple to get started with. It scales to a really tiny scale, but um, at, on the other hand, it can also scale to an incredibly large scale. And people are actively doing this. People are literally monitoring some of the largest services on the internet with Prometheus. Um, if you're interested, there are a lot of um, kind of user surveys on the Prometheus blog um, about various users of Prometheus um, and how they're using Prometheus. I highly recommend checking those out. Um, and this is kind of the end of the, uh, of the section of this talk about predictability of Prometheus. Um, hopefully I'll, I'll, I have kind of convinced you that Prometheus is highly predictable in its resource usage and is still actively being improved uh, in that way. But hopefully you now understand kind of how to evaluate and how um, understand where all this comes from with Prometheus. Uh, 
Um, but this is my kind of my last topic for this for this talk, and um, it's less about operational models, but um, more about pr making Prometheus fit your exact use case. Um, and that's why I like to refer to Prometheus as a platform. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, Prometheus is a platform to me because it has really strong stability guarantees on APIs, on the data model. Um, and what this ha has as a consequence is that you can build super opinionated models um, around that on top of Prometheus to fit exactly your organization's needs um, and workflows. Um, and one example of that, um, for example, is the integration of Kubernetes and Prometheus. I just mentioned this because it's a really popular uh, combination, and some of you may be interested um, in this particular combination. But um, I just want to show um, that there's so much possible with Prometheus, and there's lots of other integrations that I could have um, could have elaborated on here, but I'm just to chosen this because it's a really popular one. Um, so one of the teams uh, that I work with at Red Hat actually, um, and I created the um, Prometheus operator, which essentially uh, kind of brings the self-service monitoring um, aspect to Kubernetes in kind of a Kubernetes native paradigm, um, but tightly integrating into, uh, into Prometheus, um, which makes for, um, for a really nice experience for people who um, may you be super new to Prometheus, but um, very familiar with uh, Kubernetes, or even not familiar with Kubernetes, but it just all seems like the same system. And this is only possible because of its consistent configuration and such strong stability um, and consistency in its API um, so that we can kind of build around uh, Prometheus to integrate it really tightly with Kubernetes. And just one example that I want to um, kind of elaborate a little bit further on here is um, you can build tenancy models for this essentially because of that. Um, in, in Kubernetes, um, pods are typically, or not typically, every pod is um, somewhat isolated, quote unquote, um, in namespaces. So um, often namespaces are kind of used as a mean to isolate workloads. That's not to say um, isolation like containers. It's more of a logical grouping. Um, but that, as a consequence, often means that people use it as a tenancy model, saying um, namespace XYZ is my tenant XYZ. Um, and because of all of this, because we know this, we can build an opinionated system around Prometheus. And there's a, in, a, a project that uh, my group also created called the From Label Proxy. And this is an, an upstream project um, in the Prometheus community. Um, and this essentially allows you to enforce um, some, some particular label, and you can, pick, can configure it to be that namespace label from Kubernetes. And uh, you can enforce that in any query that someone does against Prometheus. And just like that, we've created an opinionated model around Prometheus without having to modify Prometheus itself, but because Prometheus is so consistent and stable in its APIs and configuration, we're actually able to do this in a reasonable manner, right? And I think this is why essentially you can refer to Prometheus as a platform and why it's such a powerful platform. You can truly make it yours and fit your organization's needs. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more that I could talk about in terms of um, the integration between Kubernetes and Prometheus. Um, there's a project that uh, we maintain called Kube Prometheus, which, which essentially packages up all of these things and how to monitor Kubernetes with Prometheus um, in this project called Kube Prometheus. I recommend you to check that out. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of go from there. Um, and then last but not least, um, leverage the ecosystem. The Prometheus ecosystem is has grown into some of the most um, incredible that I've ever seen. Um, there are so many things people are sharing, so much experiences, um, and one of the most, um, two of the most amazing things that I think have ha that has happened is, one, a lot of people have built uh, so-called exporters for almost anything you can think of in the open source world. Exporters are kind of the shim 
from some um, bespoke um, format of metrics. Let's say um, Postgres has some way to extract metrics via SQL um, out of Postgres, right? Um, and it converts that into uh, the Prometheus exposition format. And that, that kind of allows um, integrating into the Prometheus ecosystem. And for almost anything out there, there's a Prometheus exporter if the application isn't natively instrumented with Prometheus already. And the second thing is something um, that I actually uh, created with um, Tom Wilkie, the uh, now VP um, of product at Grafana, called uh, monitoring mixins. And this is essentially um, packages of alerting rules and dashboards that the community together maintains. And uh, this kind of enables us to share experience, share the way that we monitor all of these systems and kind of collaboratively um, build better and more reliable systems. And best of all, we can all do it together in a community and learn from each other. Um, so this is called monitoring mixins. Uh, you can check it out under monitoring.mixins.dev. Um, we have it. We have these for a bunch of um, components already, but um, we would love if there were even more uh, for just just about anything out there. Um, there's so much already, so I highly recommend um, kind of leverage this ecosystem. There's so much already there that you can make use of and give back to. Um, so that's kind of it. That's kind of the conclusion um, of why I think. Um, um, Prometheus is simple to operate um, and kind of summing all of this up, it's because of consistent configuration and really efficient and reliable and predictable uh, resource usage. Um, because of how the time series database works as well as how target discovery works, um, it pr provides really strong APIs and guarantees um, that you can use to make Prometheus truly your own. And last but not least, make use of the ecosystem, share, and make this ecosystem even more awesome than it already is. And with that, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to um, answer those. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Great job, Frederick. Great job, Frederick. Thank you. All right, so we had a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A uh, already. Feel free to add more there or ask in the chat. Um, one that I haven't, uh, uh, haven't answered yet, I'll try to answer here live, uh, but I'll reiterate because we have a couple of question, uh, couple, couple of minutes time so I can reiterate on the other questions as well. Um, do we get a downloadable PDF of the presentation. Yes, I believe this will be all attached to the uh, schedule. Um, so, answer this answer live. Um, and we had a couple of really awesome questions. Um, first one was from Josh um, about kernel tuning um, and controlling kind of the flushing mechanisms within Linux for uh, for the storage. I think this is a really excellent question, and uh, I could have an entire talk just about this topic. Um, so I recommend you to uh, kind of look at the um, all the kind of things around FSync uh, if you're not already already avail uh, familiar, um, because essentially uh, what can happen is uh, when Prometheus calls FSync, uh, some of this data may not be entirely written to disk yet. Um, and I uh, don't know all the details myself either, but um, essentially uh, the kernel uh, has like an expiry time, which uh, defaults to 30 or 60 seconds, depending on the distribution, Linux distribution, um, at what rate it actually kind of forces um, these to be flushed. Um, and so in Prometheus world, uh, we say that roughly two 
two failed scrapes. So by default, 15 seconds um, is acceptable. And that's why most of the time, the default in Linux distros um, is sufficient because essentially that would mean uh, at worst case, we're losing um, two, two samples and that's still, still fine for monitoring purposes. Um, then the next question was uh, whether discovery is on the main Kubernetes scheduler uh, for discovery or on the node. Um, so uh, this is basically on a global level, but you can, uh, you can limit Prometheus to only um, watch certain namespaces um, so that uh, you can kind of limit the permissions that the Prometheus potentially requires. Um, but it is either global or per namespace. Um, then the next one we have is, uh, this is also a really, really great question. Uh, is scraping just a snapshot of the system in the current state? Um, and um, how do you capture spikes essentially? So yes, um, a scrape is, is a snapshot of, uh, of the current state. Um, and this is typically not a problem with counters because co counters are monotonically increasing and you do things like rates or uh, the increase over some time. Um, so in those kind of scenarios, you will still see the spike. Um, and if you really need to narrow it down to the very second or something, you can still, you can just reduce the um, scrape interval. Um, but if this is, let's say, memory usage or something like that, uh, those are things that would need to be tracked within the application because um, because it's not uh, kind of a monotonically increasing thing. Prometheus can't um, uh, can't reason about the values that it hasn't seen in between, right? So uh, that's something that needs to be handled within the application itself. Um, then the next question we have here is uh, for Coop Prometheus, is the plan to continue to use JSONnet? Um, yes, uh, there's no no plan to uh, move away from JSON. Um, we have really great experience with it. We work with it every day. We ship it in uh, in our product. We use it for various other projects. Uh, so we're really happy with it. Um, that said, uh, we're not opposed to kind of uh, the community maintaining uh, other versions of this. There's, for, for example, already a Helm chart. Um, we just uh, don't maintain those because we don't work with those um, other mechanisms on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can kind of maintain them to the way that we would um, want to, um, to the level that, that we would want to maintain a project. Um, but yeah, we're, we're to totally happy with JSON and we're gonna continue doing that. Um, let me just mark that as question answered live. Okay, then the next question that we have is, is it possible, uh, it's possible how to export OpenStack metrics into a network project on OpenStack exporter? Um, I am not an expert on uh, the metrics uh, available in, in, in the OpenStack exporter. Um, so that's something that uh, you'll need to ask the maintainers of that project yourself. Um, Prometheus can <laughs> ingest those metrics, it's conceivable, but I just don't know. Um, whether they offer um, so. and last but not least, um, how to best scenario for persistent data with Prometheus, like say three months of data? Yes, so this is um, this is a really interesting one. Um, this uh, I actually didn't cover in so much detail. Um, Roughly, it behaves similar to um, to memory and retention. Um, so Prometheus goes through a process called compaction. And essentially, um, that means that these two-hour blocks uh, ju don't just stay two hours. But after a certain amount of time, they get compacted into larger blocks. And uh, the biggest block size that exists is uh, 14 days of data. And once this has uh, kind of reached its state, this is pretty stable in terms of the data that you will be gathering. Um, so you can essentially extrapolate from there. So you can take um, 14 days times the amount of kind of long-term data that you would want to store, um, plus all the other data that you have. Um, so uh, 
it's a it's a little bit more complicated to plan for this. Um, I, I agree, um, but you can still kind of extrapolate in the same way um, as you do with the with the memory usage. Um, okay. That was the last question that we had. Um, so if there's no other questions, then thank you for checking out this session and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.